hold on to your faith after experiencing abuse in a church? And how can you find Christian community when so many aspects of church trigger painful memories? Welcome to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's. And joining me today is Doug and Wendy Duncan, a couple who say they spent decades in an abusive cultic community in Dallas. And in that community, they were taught that God was angry and punitive, and that their community was the only true bride that God loved. The years spent in that cultic group devastated not just Doug and Wendy's sense of self, but their view of God and their ability to connect with other believers. In this podcast, the couple tell their journey into and out of this spiritually abusive community. And they share the road they took to recovery and the expertise they've gained over many years. Wendy is now a spiritual abuse recovery specialist, and Doug is a professional counselor specializing in helping people recover from religious trauma and cult involvement. This is going to be a fascinating and informative podcast, and I'm so looking forward to our discussion. But before we dive in, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this podcast, Accord Analytics and Marcourt of Barrington. In your ministry or business, your reputation is your most valuable asset. But what do you do when you suspect misconduct? Hopefully, you do the opposite of many of the organizations I report on. Instead of covering up wrongdoing, you investigate it, and Accord Analytics can help. In just 72 hours, their team of experts can scour emails, call logs, and other records to produce usable evidence. They also can analyze your organization to identify specific threats and to suggest best practices. To schedule a free consultation, go to AccordAnalytics.com. Also, if you're looking for a quality, new, or used car, I highly recommend my friends at Marcord of Barrington. Marcord is a Buick GMC dealership where you can expect honesty, integrity, and transparency. That's because the owners there, Dan and Kurt Marcord, are men of integrity. To check them out, just go to buyacar123.com. Well, again, joining me are Doug and Wendy Duncan, survivors of what they say is a pseudo-Christian Bible-based cult. Wendy has a master's degree from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and is a licensed social worker. Doug is a professional counselor and specializes in helping people recover from religious or spiritual abuse. The couple recently started the Wounded Sheep Project, which is a call to churches to reach out to those who have a wounded faith and feel estranged from God. So, Doug and Wendy, welcome, and thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much. Well, Doug and Wendy, I am so looking forward to talking to you and hearing your entire story. But before we dive in, I should probably mention that you're both contributors to a book that we're offering donors this month called Wounded Faith, Understanding and Healing from Spiritual Abuse. This is an incredible resource covering topics like dealing with the loss of identity, marital damage and recovery following religious abuse, healing your image of God, and returning to church after experiencing spiritual abuse. We're offering this book to anyone who gives a gift of $30 or more to The Roy's Report in November. To do that, just go to julieroys, spelled R-O-Y-S, dot com slash donate. So I would like to start with your journey uh, to into this Dallas cult that you experienced. And and I was surprised to find out that the name of the organization that you were a part of was Trinity Foundation, because I know Trinity Foundation. Ole Anthony, who started the group, has been on the forefront of exposing televangelists and some of their corruption. He's been on 60 Minutes. uh, And we've worked at least they've been helpful to us in some in some of our research. And so um, just surprised to, to hear that, kind of saddened to hear that. Um, but this was something you were a part of, Doug, for like, what, 20 years? Were both of you apart for like 20 years? Wendy was there about seven years, the last seven years that I was there. Early childhood, I attended a Methodist church with my parents. And then later on as an adolescent, I got very involved in several youth groups. I was in Young Life, went to college and got involved with the Navigators. I I was very involved in evangelical churches and groups as, as an adolescent. That certainly gave me a background, but I think in some ways, certain vulnerabilities to the to the pitch that Ole made, who offered what he was teaching as being the purest and the best and 
you know, the most committed version of Christianity that you could find. And, you know, since I was very gung ho, that appealed to me. Hmm. It does appeal, especially, I think, to young people who have a desire to give their lives to something and, and you want it to be something that's worth giving your life to. Um, and certainly the call of Christ is something worth giving your life to. But uh, in the expression that it sounds like you experienced uh, was pretty spiritually abusive. Wendy, with, with you, you grew up Southern Baptist, right? Yes, Lydia. Right in the Bible Belt. Mm -hmm. yep. And what was that experience like for you? My parents were both very active in the in the Baptist church. My mother was a WMU director for a while. My dad was a deacon. Hmm. Uh, you know, we were there every time the doors opened. And until my dad had an accident when I was 10 years old, you know, we were the, the model Christian family. I was estranged from God for a number of years. And then when my last semester of college, I had one of those Damascus Road experiences and God was so real, and it just changed the course of my life. Hmm. Um, I ended up going to, to a seminary, and there's a lot of other stories. But I, I've experienced spiritual abuse, church hurts, church disappointments. At the time that I met Doug, I was looking for a place that would accept me. Hmm. I had been divorced, and that was a big deal with Southern Baptists. You know, you're always kind of like a second-class citizen, you know, really as— uh, spiritual, devoted, or as good as everybody else. Hmm. So I, I meet Doug, and he invites me to a church. He says, come to our Bible study sometime, our church, on Sunday evenings. All the different Bible studies, small Bible studies, get together, and they have like a potluck dinner, and they talk, and we have such a good time. And then all the groups get together for what we call big group, and there's music, and our leader preaches. But... Julie, before I ever went to their, the first group, hmm. I called different apologetic ministries and I said, what do y'all know about Trinity Foundation? Is it a cult? Is it, you know, is it legit? And all of them said, they're eccentric, they're a little out there, but we don't see them as rising to the level of the definition of a cult. So I called Trinity Foundation and asked for their doctrinal statement. Received that in the mail, looked at it, and it just looked like any mainstream Christian church. Uh, and, and what we know now is it's not what the group says that they believe. It's how they practice what they believe. Hmm. You know, that's why, why Jesus said, by their fruits, you will know them. He, he didn't say by their doctrine, you will know them. The Pharisees had good doctrine for the most part, but they treated people badly, and that's what Jesus saw some of what happens in the churches now that would have fit now as well. What you just said, I think, is so important because when I first started doing a lot of my investigative work, when I would say, is this a cult, what I was always told is to be classified as a cult, you have to have some sort of heretical or aberrant kind of teaching. And what I was experiencing, what I was seeing, not so much experience, but hearing other people's experiences was that they had experienced just horrible spiritual abuse and bullying and and manipulation and control and all of these things. Uh, but there was almost, almost a doctrinal purity to the extent that that became, I would say in some of these cases, idolatrous. But some cases, it really had nothing to do with doctrine. It really had to do with orthopraxy, not orthodoxy. Right, orthopraxy exactly. being, you know, right practice and orthodoxy being right doctrine. Um, let me ask you, Doug, since you were the first to get involved with uh, Ole Anthony and the Trinity Foundation, what was it? I mean, you said a little bit that you were attracted to this idea of the perfect expression. Mm -hmm. um, can you give me some more details on how you were sort of recruited into this group? Part of what was going on, I think, with me at the time is, it, you know, as a college student and very involved in evangelicalism is that I was under a lot of probably mostly self-induced pressure to perform. Mm -hmm. And so you have, uh, you know, evangelicalism as performance, religion as performance. And and so initially, uh, Oli was was proffering a very extreme form of grace, which actually probably was not right. I mean, it was... A license, I guess. There was plenty of heresy that Oli taught. You know, once mm. once you got below the surface and how he he wanted to present himself to the world, 
he had all kinds of crazy, weird, heretical Gnostic doctrines that he was teaching. He wanted a certain amount of acceptance in the apologetics ministries because of his work with the televangelists. So he wanted to look like he was mainstream, but he certainly was not. I mean, he taught plenty of really strange, offbeat, heretical, crazy things. But, you know, initially it just, you know, it seemed very, very gracey, you know, it wasn't about performance. This was the 70s. It was kind of, kind of had a hippie vibe to it and people cussed, people drank. It, it was a rowdy bunch. But at the same time, you know, he he offered it like, you know, he was like Jesus. He was hanging out with the people from the street. You know, this was all exciting and interesting to us because, you know, you had people who were drug addicts and hookers and, you know, all kinds of wild, crazy things. And people would get in arguments in Bible study and they'd shout at each other and people would cry. It was actually pretty interesting. Hmm. The joke was we had grown up in Ozzie and Harriet land. So it just seemed kind of interesting and it felt very authentic. It felt like grace. It felt like you didn't have to perform. But, you know, ironically, over the years, the thing completely turned around and it was constant performance all the time. But the performance was not about moral purity as much as it was just to be obedience to leadership and, you know, being you know, gung ho for whatever the project that Oli was working on at that moment. Hmm. So. One of the things that attracted me was all of us lived semi communally, homeschooled the children. We had all our meals together. We were in and out of each other's homes. It was community, community, lay down your life. Well, I liked all that. I mean, I liked that idea about uh, community. And they liked me, and I liked that they liked me. Hmm. And they accepted me, and they didn't care that I was divorced. Hmm. In fact, they thought I was too religious. So what were some red flags that you began seeing and saying, this does not seem to be all what it's cracked up to be? One red flag for me was my mother hated the group. She felt like I should not be involved in, and it was carrying me down a bad path, that it was a cult. But, you know, again, I was 18, 19 years old when I first started getting involved and, you know, thought this was the right thing. This is what God wanted me to do. And so rather than listen to my mother, I I followed the siren call of a false prophet. Interestingly, Oli was right about some things. He had some legitimate points that he was correct about, about the prosperity gospel and televangelist. His motivation for doing it had more to do with getting publicity for himself, and he wanted to be a hero and a rescuer of Christianity and seen as a prophet and all of that. But Oli was able to accomplish a lot because he had slave labor to do all of that stuff. In the early years, especially, it was all about only getting a forum just so he could be on TV. And I think that was really his motivation. And I think, Wendy, you write that at one point you began to realize there's a lot of talk from the leader of sacrifice for everyone else. But when you began to look, you didn't see the leader sacrificing. You saw the people sacrificing for the leader and the leader kind of living, it sounds like a pretty cushy life. That's true. He talked about sacrificing and laying down his life and that he'd given up fame and fortune and everything for us. But early, 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 when I first started going, I wanted to see, you know, because in the Baptist church, when they had the the meetings, you got a budget report. Mm -hmm. So I asked, you know, if I could see the budget report or the financial report. Mm -hmm. Only blew up. He blew up at me. He was so angry and talked about me not trusting and me not understanding the doctrine and, you know, just laid into me about all of my bad stuff. During the early days, I questioned some of the doctrine and he would humiliate me and ridicule me in front of all these people. And so finally, I just, you know, shut down and didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I often say that when I first got there, I did not believe what they believed. And then slowly I started realizing that I didn't know really what I believed anymore. Hmm. And then eventually I did believe what they, what they taught. It was a typical thought reform environment. Well, explain that. There's a really good book Christians everywhere should read called 
The Psychology of Totalism, a study of thought reform in China by Robert Lifton, who's a psychiatrist. And so it's really the seminal work in the anti-cult field because it explains thought reform, what used to be called brainwashing many years ago, that turns out a favor. But he basically says that there are eight criteria that that create a thought reform environment. You don't necessarily have to have all eight, but all thought reform environments will have some of the eight. So there was milieu control. Like your environment, controlling the environment? Yeah, yeah. You've, you've, got to, you've got to control the, the information and all of that. That's why, you know, cults will cut off people's relationships with those outside that, you know, it's a subtle process. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you keep people busy, you know, you have Bible study several nights a week so that they don't have much time to do anything else or be with other people or read other books that are not, you know, the things they're supposed to be reading. It's interesting to me, you're describing this in the context of a cult, and yet so many of the investigations I've done with churches where it's not a cult, um, supposedly, but that same sort of thing happens where mm -hmm. you your kids go to the church or they right. do homeschooling and only one way of doing it is is correct and right. Um, mm -hmm. The doctrine is so pure from up front from this church that mm -hmm. you only read their books and the books of people they approve. Right. Um, and so it becomes a very insular community. And then without even meaning to do this, people realize all of their relationships, all of them, mm -hmm. are within this group. And so, uh, when they leave, it becomes like their whole world that they've built for like 20 years, 25 years, it it just comes crumbling down. So, Absolutely. so I think this milieu control that you're talking about, again, within in the context of a cult is so relevant, I know, to so many people listening right now who are going to say, dang, that happened to me to some extent. And there is, there's, there's true... I mean, Romans 12, that, you know, we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds, but that is conformed to Scripture, not through one person or one church group's interpretation right. of Scripture. So, you know, I really appreciate what you're talking about. So, okay, milieu control, what are some of the other things? All right, then there's mystical manipulation, which is like planned spontaneity. So, you know, may, maybe you'll have a healing that would happen. You know, Jim Jones used to do this in his mm -hmm. group. He had these basically fake healings, but they were very dramatic and created the expected emotional response from everybody. But it's manipulation, but to get everybody to believe that they're having a spiritual experience in the context of the mm -hmm. environment. Cults and cult leaders, they, they're always demanding you to do better, to do better, to, to be perfect even though that's impossible, as we know, nobody is ever going to be perfect. And yet, for the cultic group, you're never good enough. Let, let me stop you on just that mm -hmm. one point, because it's very interesting to me what you're describing, where the, the church was, or the, even the doctrine at first to you is presented as sort of antinomian, which is mm -hmm. uh, this sort of hyper grace that it doesn't even matter what you do, because it's all covered by grace. And so... Right. It's almost where Paul says, uh, should we send more that grace may abound, you know? <laughs> and right, of course, he right. says, God forbid. But but antinomianism, again, is this just really, really hyper-grace thing. And mm -hmm. then it went to almost a hyper-legalism exactly. of you have to do everything just right and, and just, just perfect. And yet, it almost has to go to that hyper-legalism for the control to happen, like like you're right. describing. So, I mean, I, I find that fascinating, and I do find fascinating how many hyper-legalistic, hyper-controlling, uh, very shame-based kind of doctrine comes out of places with the name grace. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, the first church that I went to, you know, you were supposed to come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, and the preacher would even say, the really good Christians come on Wednesday. Uh, you were expected to go to Bible studies, visitation, read your Bible every day. I mean, there was a whole list of things that you were supposed to do in order to be a good Christian. But it had nothing to do with the relationship with God. It mm -hmm. had to do with performance. Very interesting. So that's always going to be a thing in communist China, people having to engage in self-criticism. But there's always this thing of always 
having to examine and confess your own sins and a lot of times confess them to the group. And of course, the Trinity Foundation, they took that to a, a, an extreme, you know, where, to, to the point of, of having hot seat sessions where people were just broken down psychologically. You know, they confess all your sins to the group and then have everybody wail on you for a while and until Oli had decided that you had had enough and were sufficiently penitent. And then he would be the one to say, okay, you know, God forgives you or whatever. Hmm. Doug and I have been facilitating a support group for former members of cults and spiritual abusive groups for about 15 years. And it's amazing because it does not matter if they are coming from a fundamentalist church, Bible-based church, or Eastern religion, or what. Hmm. They all have the same characteristics. A lot of times when you have several new members in the support group or whatever, somebody will look around and say, did all our leaders go to the same school of the dark arts to learn how to be manipulators? And and Wendy's right. There's You really can't tell the difference between that somebody was a Hindu guru hmm. who was abusive or a Christian pastor, frankly. It, it, you know, it's the same set of techniques that they all use. It seems like every single one of these groups, if you look at it, there is just some real gross hypocrisy going on. Yes. For example, you say there's these really high standards that are applied to the members, right? So there's a lot of works for the members. And yet for the leaders, when you bring up things, or if you dare, about their behavior, that's off limits, right? Right. Right. So they have license. They have license. They have no true accountability, which I think is a line of demarcation Mm -hmm. in in a healthy church, in a healthy, honestly, in a healthy institution, business or nonprofit or anything. The leadership has accountability. And these leaders, these abusive leaders are very good at evading accountability. And And a lot of times that's why they set up the whole thing the way they set it up. I'm curious with with you, when did it get to the point, and you know, I'm guessing you're having these discussions between the two of you where you're saying mm-hmm. something's not right. And, and so when did it kind of grow into sort of a crisis? Actually, we did not have those conversations very often hmm. because you didn't talk about leadership. You didn't talk about the elders. Yeah, no gossiping. You couldn't talk about leadership because you would be violating the injunction against gossiping, which I understand why gossiping is bad. But the way that these groups apply that sometimes, it's... It, it's it, to keep themselves from being criticized yeah, by people. Right, that there, that there would never be an opportunity for anybody to even get to the point of being able to hold them accountable because to even have a conversation gets you know, gets labeled as gossip. We did not have those conversations. What was the straw that broke the panels back with us was we wanted to get married. And at Trinity Foundation, you had to have the blessing of Oli and the elders in order to get married. But they did not want us to get married primarily. And that's another example of the control by the leadership. We dated for seven years. The week before we got married, my Bible study leader, one of the elders told me, God is going to kick your butt if you marry Doug. I can't tell you how much that scared me and how upset that made me because I, all week long I was thinking, oh, something's going to happen to Doug. He's going to get in a car wreck or something is going to happen. Hmm. And what, what she says is true. God's going to punish me you know, for, for marrying Doug. What a cruel thing to say to somebody. What? Talk about spiritual abuse. I mean, that was horrendous. And one of the men said, why haven't you two gotten married yet? And Wendy said, Trinity Foundation won't let us. And Mike said, well, I'm Trinity Foundation. I haven't said anything about you can't get married. And I think that was a that was a wake up moment where we said, wait a minute. It's not Trinity that doesn't want us to get married. It's Oli. He was constantly badgering Doug. Every time Doug would bring up the fact that we would like to get married, he would make it about Doug wasn't being content and being single. One morning, he badgered and and harassed and ridiculed Doug in a Bible study meeting. 
And when Doug told me that, for some reason, I snapped. So I went to Oli and I said, Oli, I am so tired of you telling Doug that he's out of the wrist and that he's not being content if he wants to get married. And Oli, your voice is so loud, I can't hear God's anymore. Hmm. And so I ran out of the room. And that, that's what ended up being the title of the book that I wrote. I can't hear God anymore. Hmm. Because Oli had replaced God, his voice. After that, you know, I was going to a meeting and I started crying because I thought I had lost the love of my life. You know, I finally found a man who was a Christian, who loved God, and I thought he would never forgive me. I realized that Wendy was right and that Oli was abusive, that he was abusing his authority. And so, long story short, we ended up basically eloping. And then that started a cascading series of events that led to us leaving the group several months later. But They were so angry, so angry that we got married. That is, again, another hallmark of spiritually abusive environments is they don't respect your personal boundaries. Right. I mean, right. you should be able to make personal decisions about marriage. Now, I mean, if somebody, if, if somebody doesn't meet, you know, say they're not a believer, okay, that, that might be a biblical standard. But, I mean, the other things that you're talking about, like some sort of hoops you have to jump through that are extra biblical, this is just... Again, it's overstepping boundaries, and I'm guessing there are other boundaries because there always are. And that's another one of Lifton's criteria: that doctrine over person. So whatever the whatever the teaching is becomes more important than the humans that you should be trying to shepherd and minister to. So it, it becomes about our, our you know our rules, our system, our procedures, our our doctrine. This is the the letter of the law rather than the spirit of it. And so I think that was part of the thing there too. So eventually you do leave mm -hmm. and you leave as, as I understand it, pretty broken, pretty mm -hmm. confused, pretty without a sense of self. And I so appreciate uh, your chapter in, in this book, Wounded Faith, Wendy, where you talk about, healing our image of God. And even, even it's our image of self, because you, you talk about how your image of self and your image of God are connected. So talk about that. How What was your image of God coming out of the Trinity Foundation? That God hated us. Hmm. And that he, he only loved us if we were a part of the bride of Christ, which was the community. You were the only bride. Wow. Yeah, the, the Trinity Foundation was the bride of Christ. And God hated you if you were not a part of the bride, you were not a part of the group. Mm -hmm. So he did not love the isolated believer. He did not love the individual believer. You hear something over and over and over for years and years and years, you begin to believe it. I did not believe it at first, but I began to believe mm -hmm. that God hated me, that God was harsh and cruel, had no mercy was just, you know, waiting to punish me for anything that I did. And Oli told me he did not want to have a relationship with you. That's egotistical for you to think that God, the God of the universe, would want to have a relationship with you. God does not want you to pray to him. I mean, you know, that is just so arrogant. Yeah, arrogant for you to think that the God of the universe would want a relationship with you or want you to pray. So hmm. that's that's what I believed about God when I left. All spiritually abusive groups and cults pervert who God really is, the character of God. And, you know, it is so painful because, you know, we see so many people that are just so broken and they don't want anything to do with God. You know, they're like, no, there's no God. God would not have allowed that to happen to me. You know, and, and most of the time people join churches or these groups because they have a heart for God. They want to know more about him. And then they get abused and their faith is shattered. Hmm. That was probably my first task in the recovery was trying to figure out who God was. And I would tell Doug, Doug, I just want my relationship with God back. And he was like, you can't have that previous relationship with God back. You know, hmm. you know that, that's gone. And the other thing is when I did talk to God, I'd say, you know, God, I want a relationship with you again, but I don't like you. You know, mm. I don't like you because you're 
angry all the time and you don't you don't like me and all that. I said, but I want to have a relationship with you. <laughs> I don't like you. Mm. But uh, so while I went through the whole process, I started reading books. I couldn't read my Bible, by the way. I started reading other authors who had struggled with their faith. I was reading one of those books and all of a sudden, it, you know, I had one of those aha moments and I said, that's who he is. That's God. Now I remember. Now I know who he is. And that was just the beginning of reconnecting with God, that God was a God of grace and love and mercy. And he hurt because I had been through that experience. His heart because hurts because all these people have gone through these horrible experiences when all they wanted to do was get to know God better. One of those books that was so helpful to you was The Shack. Uh, and and yeah, I know that know that that, yeah. that book. Well, I had my own experience with the shack. So um, really, so when I was at Moody, so I was on Moody Radio for you know ten years, and the shack was just you know vilified. Like you you mm -hmm. cannot read the shack. I mean, God's not a woman, and he appears as a woman, and this is you know heretical and blah blah blah. I never read it because I was busy doing other things, and then I finally realized when the movie came out, I'm like, okay, I can give two hours to just see what this is. And I watched it, and I saw the line that was really close to universalism. Like, it gets really, really close to that line. But it never fully goes over, and the truth is, it's it's not even saying that God is a woman, because it, you refer to, the it is a woman that portrays God in the movie, but she's called Papa. And it's simply because this man has been so hurt by men that, it, that this is a, a a way that God can relate to to him, but it's not saying that God is male, which God isn't male or female anyway. I mean, he might relate to as masculine, but we won't go into that. But but yeah, it was so disregarded, and I watched this movie, and I was profoundly impacted by the shack. Wow! And when I watched it, I thought of a family member, and I said, "This family member has to watch the shack." Hmm. I just knew it. Like I'm like. And so I called the person up. The person was far from God at that point, although I should say was was coming closer to God. Um, and I said, can we just go see this together? And the person said, yes. And we saw it, and this person is bawling during it. Of course, I'm bawling during it. And and afterwards, I mean, it was, it was profound. Um, I prayed with that person to... Wow. Uh, to start that relationship again with God, because mm. I, th I somehow, and, and even I think if you grow up in a, a good church, um, it's it, sometimes the the expectations of God. You know, we should God's holiness should make us better understand His grace, right? Mm -hmm. And should make us better understand His love. But sometimes that's just a disconnect. It just is. And so I found that book, um, that story, mm. remarkably powerful and mm -hmm. expresses the love of God in, in such, and the mystery of God. Yeah. Because, you know, this side of eternity, we, we really will not get that God is great and God is good and bad things happen to me. Mm -hmm. We just, I mean, you can wrestle with that all day. Job wrestled with it and he never even got an answer, right? I mean, other than... For me to describe this to you, you know, would be beyond your ability to comprehend. And at some point, there has to be some trust, and we have to to believe. But yeah, when you when you mentioned the book, The Shack, and having those experiences with God, and and for for me, I don't think if I if I hadn't had in my journey those experiences of knowing profoundly experiencing mm -hmm. God and His love in a profound way, we wouldn't be talking right now. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. That, you know, and, and, but it is interesting to me that sometimes God uses the very things that have been told us are off limits. This yeah. is bad. Yeah. I'm so glad that you said that um, because when I started writing about the shack, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going, <laughs> I'm gonna You're gonna get really, it. really criticized for this because I was born evangelical Christians, you didn't read those kind of books. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those were heretical. Mm 
but yet it, it had touched my life. And, um, and and you're right. I had this. I had the same thing happen. If it had not been for such a profound encounter with God and relationship with God, I could have gone through all of the church hurts and church disappointments and abuse that I've gone through. I clung to that, mm-hmm. and you know, I'm so glad that that I had that to cling to. But uh, I th- thank you for saying that about the shack. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, it, to me, it's it's sad that it has been vilified the way that it has. Mm-hmm. And I do think it, now, would I give the shack to somebody who was steeped in New Age and Universalism? And I, no, probably not. Mm-hmm. I think though, it can be a very powerful tool for understanding the love of God. Especially if, you know, right, having right doctrine is not a lot of our problems, you know? Right. right. It's, it's understanding and comprehending and experiencing God's love. And mm-hmm. God is love. So if you miss that, you miss kind of the whole thing. Yeah. I don't know if you've read much of Henry Nowen, but one of the books that he wrote is, is The Life of the Beloved. He talks about how we are the beloved. And once you really get your head and heart around that, it's life changing yeah. when you can can tell yourself, "I'm the beloved," and it's not mm. about me; it's about God. That's who God is. And I also wanted to say um, that you know what you said about God being a mystery—that mm-hmm. is so true. This side of heaven, we're never going to know everything. We're not going to know why He does what He does. Now, when I was growing up and in the churches that I belonged to, you know, we were always trying to figure out what God was up to. <laughs> and we wanted to put him in a very neat box with a bow on top. Right. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until much, much later that I realized, huh, God is a mystery. How in the world am I going to figure out the God of the universe? You know, his, his ways are not our ways. So, mm, so good. You know. The one thing, too, that I wanted to hone in and something you wrote about is that you also had to find an expression of the church, you know, talk a little bit about that part of your journey. You know, we criticized liturgical churches when I was growing up. Hmm. You know, they didn't really know what they were doing. It was all rote. It was all ritual. We started going to an Episcopal church, and it was the liturgy that gave me back my ability to worship God. Hmm. Because when I couldn't pray, the prayers were there for me. Yeah. When I couldn't read Scripture, the Scripture was read. When I couldn't sing, everything about the liturgy is to pull you into the worship. So it's a body worship. You bow in the name of Jesus is said. There's times you kneel and stand and do different things. And it it is just so impactful. It gave me back my relationship with God and Mm. a way to worship God. So I will always be grateful for that. What happened with me is... After we left Trinity Foundation, of course, you know, we had spent so much time investigating all of the pastors and evangelicals that, you know, everything just seemed tainted for me and shallow. And Wendy soldiered on looking for a church. You know, I I wasn't really going in the wake of that experience. But I did suggest to her that maybe we could try a liturgical church. I had a friend growing up who was an Episcopalian and I would go to church with him and his family sometimes. And so I said, maybe we can try an Episcopal church. And I I hadn't been in one in I don't know how long, but, but we went to the early service of one because at that time I was working on Sundays in retail. So we'd go to the early service. And of course, like there, you know, like six people there. I mean, it's very, very few people there at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, and we didn't know what to do. You know, there's there's all the things, you know, where you're supposed to kneel and then you're supposed to do this. And then it came time for communion and everybody goes down to the altar rail to receive communion. And the priest came out from behind the, the altar rail because we just stayed back in the pews. And he said, would you like to come have communion with us? And we said, you know, we're not members of this church. And he said, that's okay. We invite all baptized Christians to have communion. We were baptized Christians, so we we went down. And that was my profound experience at that moment, because having left 
Trinity Foundation, you know, having flamed out of my cult, I, you know, I, I didn't know. I thought God might be done with me. Mm. And then I had just a profound experience of grace and felt God reaching back to me, you know, through the process of the priest and the communion and, and you know, having having Eucharist there in that little Episcopal church. That was my moment of reconnection. It was a, another moment of, of conversion for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it really reconnected me with God. And so we, we ended up joining that little church and went through confirmation and we're still Episcopalians. And, you know, it's still a spiritual home for us. I still feel that same connection to God every Sunday morning when we when we go and we have communion. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I grew up very low church and looking down, you know, as all of us evangelicals did, down our nose at all the high church and liturgical mm -hmm. stuff is too Catholic or whatever. Um, and it's it's beautiful. And, I, you know, after you've read some of those prayers, then the prayers that you often hear that are just made up on the spot seem kind of trite. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. that somebody put a lot of time into a prayer that actually leads you in prayer and expresses right. things and reminds you of things that you need that, that are already on your heart, but, you know, maybe hadn't been so beautifully expressed that way and, and will remind you again. And to, to me, it's, it's gorgeous. And that in the Eucharist in an Anglican service uh, is just Absolutely. I mean, it takes you to the throne. I mean, right? I mean, that, it's it it's it's phenomenal. And there's and and I love that the Eucharist is the high point, and that is where the church comes together. You know, that right. we are one body, and Christ is our head. Yes. Not a pastor, not a leader. It's right. Christ is our head, and I and I think that's just so critical. Um, you wrote a chapter on reconnecting returning mm -hmm. to church and i thought it was so good the the red flags that you mm -hmm. said you know here are some things to look for when after you know coming out of spiritual abuse you're looking for church although i would say these are things that just generally are probably good things to look for um would you go through some of those red flags that yeah. you should be alert to and be be aware of when you're going into a church church should not put itself in the place and and certainly this is what I experienced with Oli like they're in control of the spigot and they can turn your relationship with God on and off mm -hmm. your relationship with God is between you and God and I and I understand you express that in you know in service and in fellowship and and other things uh, but but your relationship with God doesn't belong to your pastor that's something that's between you and God. People who put themselves in the position of saying you're on the outs with God, that's a huge red flag, very, very culty. You also talked about your faith not being just an intellectual exercise. And, and I would even put in there mm -hmm. a doctrinal exercise. Why is that so important? Well, it's because... It's not doctrine over person. It's person in relationship over doctrine. When I read the words of Jesus in the Gospels, and again, I'm not saying that doctrine is not important or that it's not real or anything, but Jesus talked about relationship and he talked about love and he talked about service and giving and all the things that, that really truly make up who we are. And certainly the doctrine informs that, but it's not really the main thing. It's it's not really the main thing with God. God desires our heart. He desires our trust. He he desires our faithfulness, our faith. And I think that's really what the walk is about, is walking in trust, in love with your father. And I think a lot of the other things that, that you bring out are things, even in our discussion, you know, like permitting questions. It should yes, be an environment absolutely. where you where you can where you can ask not using scripture to control. I mean, mm -hmm. when that scripture becomes a tool in the hands of the leadership to make you do things, often for them, not even for God, but for them or for their, you know, initiative, we're going to do this this thing or that thing. I remember being in the church and there, there were extra biblical things I was being asked to do and I couldn't be in leadership unless I did. And I'm like, wait, I, I don't even agree with this. So I, I think that's another big red flag that you point out that I think is important. 
And then I think over overemphasizing those harsh demands of discipleship. I mean, right. being a disciple of Christ, it. I mean, he does say, take up your cross, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. He also says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So you have to interpret scripture in the light of all scripture. And I think that's that's another thing that cults do is the proof texting that they, they will redline one scripture and say, okay, this is the thing. It's a thing, it's in scripture, but it's not the only scripture and you have to interpret it in the light of other scripture as well. So they get out of balance. And interestingly, Oli hated the word balance. You, you would always irritate him if you said anything <laughs> about balance. You know, I find balance is an important thing for believers to have. I, I, and I, I think that that was what drew me into Trinity Foundation is because, you know, I, I was already obsessive in my evangelicalism. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. think my, my walk was healthy prior to, to running into Oli. You know, looking back on it, I, I, you know, I think it was performance driven. It was obsessive that that set me up to be easy to manipulate, you know, whereas I think, you know, a mature Christian faith and walk is is much more about balance and understanding that. Sure, you don't want to be lackadaisical. You don't want to be lukewarm. But at the same time. You know, fanaticism. I, I don't. I don't think really that's what Christ is calling us to. Well, I so appreciate again your work that you've done, and this book I think is an incredible resource for folks. I would add two more things on that. One is church governance, and I've said this before mm -hmm. in podcasts. People's yeah. eyes glaze, glaze over when you talk about church governance, but it is so important because whenever you see abuse, if, if you look at church governance you'll find that there's almost always no accountability. So there has to be real accountability there. And the other is transparency. If you don't know what your pastor makes, and don't give me this, you know, that's private, whatever. No, I'm paying my money to you. And if you were a secular nonprofit, you would have to publish your 990 with all of the top wage earners public. Mm -hmm. And so I expect the same transparency from a church. In fact, I would expect more than from right. a secular nonprofit. And cannot we do that for our people? And if we're embarrassed or we think our people wouldn't understand the salaries or the, w the way we're spending our money, then maybe you shouldn't be spending your money that way because they're the ones who are giving you the money. So mm -hmm. ag again, I, I think that's so critically important. Uh, ironically, that is one thing the Trinity Foundation <laughs> was was big on was the the financial part, but but some of these other ones not so much. It's so important mm -hmm. for people that are listening to your podcast to know that there is hope that mm -hmm. they can recover from spiritual abuse or cultic abuse. That there is hope they can reconnect with God, and you know what we tell folks all the time. It's not easy. It's going to be the hardest thing you've done, but recovery, you can recover. Yeah. But thank you for the work you've done. I know you've done so much uh, speaking and helping other groups of people uh, find their way out of uh, cults or out of spiritually abusive environments and uh, find health again in this road to recovery. So I just really appreciate that and appreciate the time we spent. So thank you. Thank you. And, this was fun. Yeah. And we really appreciate all that you have done. Yeah, for okay. sure. Again, thanks so much for listening to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Royce. And just a reminder that we're able to do this podcast and all our investigative work at The Roy's Report because of the support from people like you. And this month, if you give a gift of $30 or more to The Roy's Report, we'll send you a copy of Wounded Faith, Understanding and Healing from Spiritual Abuse. To give, just text 22525 on your phones and the word report. That's 22525 and the word report. Or go to julieroys, spelled R-O-Y-S, dot com slash donate. That's julieroys.com slash donate. Also, just a quick reminder to subscribe to The Roy's Report on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. That way, you'll never miss an episode. And while you're at it, I'd really appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word about the podcast by leaving a review. And then please share the podcast on social media so more people can hear about this great content. Again, thanks so much for joining me. I hope you were blessed and encouraged. Mm -hmm.